The First Amendment states the freedom of speech and of the press. We have folks who legitimately are out there to try to confuse people and create confusion. But what happens when people use that freedom the wrong way? They're trying to keep their numbers up, trying to keep their ratings up, um, and I think that can jeopardize journalism. Sir, since you're attacking us, you are fake news. The justice of journalism with the menace of media. This is In News We Trust. Trust in the news is changing. Stories come out every day with false information, with facts that have been twisted. The relationship that the journalists had with the people has been stretched thin. The number of news outlets that have their own agendas politically is climbing, and they often present information in a way that sways the true nature of a story. Relying on only one source of information can be dangerous, and only furthers the political polarity, splitting the people apart. Staying informed as a voter is essential for a democracy to function. The ability to read, interpret, and make an educated decision based on the information you receive stops our government from falling into chaos, and that's where the news comes into play. The necessity of news media, along with their duty to inform, has become apparent in many places throughout history, such as Edward Snowden, the Vietnam War, and even the Watergate scandal. The relations between President Nixon and the media were less than stellar, but when the break-in at the Democratic National Committee happened, it was the media that kept Nixon on his toes and ultimately uncovered the secrets. Journalists are the ones that discover information and get it out to the public, but that's not all there is to it. In our land of liberty, war has been declared on the freedom of the press covered in the First Amendment. The press is being attacked, but how can they defend false information? Although the news is meant to report on politics, it has become a category of politics itself. The issue is that journalists all around America are either spreading false information unknowingly or purposely planting false information in the news. Both scenarios abandon the journalistic integrity, which can be summed up as the duty to spread facts as accurately and fairly as possible. All of this combined is what has spawned the desperately low trust in news. Whether it's your local station or one a million miles away, news is everywhere and many people have different feelings on trusting local and national news and knowing the differences between the two. National media has a pretty large scope that it covers. It's going to cover things of well national importance, but also it will highlight local news stories that um, it thinks would catch the interest of the entire population. Local media is very invested in covering local stories, and that's extremely important because they serve as watchdogs on local governments, on municipalities that often nobody else is paying attention to. Your local on-air personality comes into your home every day, several times a day. Not only that, you see them out shopping. You know their kids. You go to school with their kids. Um, you, you, you identify with them as an individual. The national news covers national time, stories, but local Indiana, news is South, split up by markets. For instance, in Michigan, Detroit is the biggest media market and Alpena is the smallest. Media markets are based on the amount of viewers, listeners, and readers. Though there is a difference on how local a media outlet gets. Hyper or micro-local are types of media outlets for one specific community instead of a metropolitan area. After that comes local media, which covers individual metropolitan areas. Examples of this are Detroit and Flint, with Detroit being the biggest media market and Flint being a smaller one. At the national news level, they cover important topics for the whole nation to know, along with local stories that impact the country as a whole. Americans have come to rely on these news services, but recently, according to a Pew Research poll, things are changing. According to a study done by Pew Research Center back in 2016, only 22% of people said that they trusted the local media a lot. National news organizations, on the other hand, only had 18% of people say that they trusted it a lot. Social media, the number is drastically different, with only 4% of people saying that they trusted their news from social media a lot. More changes occurred between the years 2016 and 2017, which coincided with the heavy media coverage of the 2016 presidential election. And here's how it breaks down by party. In 2016, 15% of Republicans said that they trusted the national news, but in 2017, that number dropped to 11%. On the other hand, in 2016, 27% of Democrats said that they trusted national news, and in 2017, that number went up to 34%. Now let's take a look at local news. 
In 2016, 23% of Republicans said that they trusted local news. And in 2017, that number went up by only 1%. Democrats had a big jump for their trust in news. In 2016, 29% said that they trusted local news. But in 2017, that number went up to 36%. Social media had the lowest numbers of all, with both parties' trust levels coming in at just under 6% for before and after 2017. All across the charts, it appears that the American people trust their local news outlets significantly more than their national news outlets. Through the data presented, it's clear that Republicans are trusting media less and Democrats are trusting the media more. There are thousands of news outlets across the United States, and there is something that many of them have in common. A large number of them are owned by the same gigantic companies. While the number of different owners is shrinking, so is the variety of opinions. DTV's Rebecca Allen shows us this alarming trend in media ownership. Today, many Americans have the access to multiple news outlets, from television, radio, and even social media pages, to find the inside scoop on an array of topics. However, recent ownership laws have changed what the people are seeing, what they're hearing, and ultimately, how they trust. In the fall of 2017, the Federal Communications Commission eliminated media ownership laws that Chairman Ajit Pai claimed were decades old. The relaxing of media ownership has been underway since 1996. Though the change has been surging, recently it has sparked a ton of debate and now consumers of media are worried that media diversity is ceasing. According to a recent study done by the Morris Creative Group and Frugildad, 41% of Americans trust local media stations, above the 27% that claim they'd rather get their information from national stations. This 41% may not know that large broadcasting superpowers are taking over local media. As of 2013, Sinclair owns 161 stations in 78 different markets. Nexstar owns 51 stations in 45 markets. Tribune owns 44 stations in 35 markets. And Gannett owns 41 stations in 31 markets. These four companies are still increasing business steadily. Your favorite national media sources are not immune to the growing monopoly either. 90% of channels on your television are owned by the same six companies. GE, Disney, Viacom, News Corp, Time Warner, and CBS. Just 28 years ago in 1983, the same 90% was owned by 50 companies. The Big Six's total 2010 revenue was $275.9 billion. That's enough to buy each NFL football team roughly 12 times. The media has an influence in our everyday lives, even when you don't tune in to the 6 o'clock news. And with only 231 media executives controlling the diet of information that millions of Americans digest, it isn't as diverse as you may think. Shrinking ownership is placing stress on the trust between journalists, owners, and consumers. Sinclair Broadcasting is a prime example of how the decline in ownership can affect how viewers take in the media, and it often raises the question, can this change be both good and bad for the world of journalism? DTV's Bailey Talaska explains the effect ownership can have on local news. Joel Fike, a reporter and anchor for WEYI, has witnessed firsthand the impact a change in ownership can have on a station. We were the laughing stock at one point in this market. We really were. I mean, we were terrible third in the ratings, didn't have the equipment, didn't have the facilities. Um, it was awful. And we've been purchased by Sinclair, and they pretty much literally came in here, the chairman of Sinclair, over in the other station, and said, we're going to get you out of here, and we're going to give you everything they, you need. And they have. Sinclair Broadcasting, a media company that owns almost 200 local stations and counting, soon emerged a tribune, making them the biggest media company in the U.S. Even with Sinclair owning all these stations, it doesn't look like it affects anything from an outside perspective. And for the most part, the local reporter is not affected by Sinclair ownership. Absolutely never, never has my boss come to me and said, Fike, you know what? I want you to take this angle with it. Never. But Sinclair does make each of their stations air what are called must runs. These are programs that the local stations must fit into their newscast. Most of these programs are biased and project the viewpoint of Sinclair. 
it's the viewpoint of the company. It really doesn't impact me. You know, all I can really focus on is what Joel Fike is going out to report on. Um, they're there, they're part of it. It's, it's part of the equation. There's nothing I can do about it. To combat this, stations have been airing the must runs late at night when there are less people watching. It's going to be difficult to get Democrats on board here. Recently, with all the attacks accusing journalists of fake news, Sinclair made a promo to show that their stations do not support fake news. DTV interviewed members of WEYI before this promo had been released. Sinclair handed down a script and told local anchors and reporters to record it as is. But we are concerned about the troubling trend of irresponsible one-sided news stories plaguing our country. The, the sharing of biased and false, and false news, news has become, become all too all common, common on, social, on media. social media. More alarming, some, some media, media outlets, outlets publish, publish these, these same fake stories without checking facts first. This promo was a clear example of media ownership telling news people what to do. Another issue with ownership is state-funded media. An example would be Sputnik Radio, a radio station owned by the Russian government. The Hurricane Maria aftermath is... So our connection is really principally organizational, right? Like they set up the company, they fund the company, they helped us get this together. Um, outside of that, we have almost no connection. Eugene Perrier, radio host of the show by any means necessary, says that Russia does not have any influence on what they can and cannot say. Ultimately, the connection we have is, I think, the same connection that BBC has to the British government. Obviously, they're being funded by the British government, but it's not as if the prime minister's office is calling up Broadcasting House and saying, you must cover X, you must cover Y. They cover it however they more or less see fit. Even though Eugene says that Russia does not have much influence on their shows, the American government still made Sputnik sign up as a foreign agent operating in the U.S. So to me, the fact that BBC doesn't have to register, that Francois Cat doesn't have to register, that Deutsche Welle doesn't have to register, but we now have to register RT, Xuan Ha from China, really makes me think that it's more political as opposed to at all journalistic. Per year and others worry that this government interference is a threat to our democracy. It's very problematic because it's suggesting that just by being from a certain country, journalism all of a sudden becomes illegitimate. And I think we're in a, in, a, in a country where we pride ourselves on having a multiplicity of views. I think that's a really dangerous, really slippery slope for us to start to go down. Technology is going through some big changes, and with this comes a variety of new media platforms. DTV's Jordan Button and Emily Ferrante tell us about this change and what it means for media consumers. The days of waiting for the morning edition and the 6 o'clock news to start are now fading, thanks to the introduction of the internet. You can now find constant news 24-7 from computers to your smartphone. And you can not only get it on your television, you can get it on your cell phone, you can get it on your iPad. And people expect now news 24-7, 365. A study done by the American Press Institute found that 33% of people follow the news all day. Right now, digital news is only second to television, but some people believe that will quickly change and will benefit the future of media. I think it's going to keep changing like it is right now. It's going to be more on your phone. Um, people aren't going to rely on the cable channels near as much. In the long run, I think it'll be really good because it challenges what media is and what good journalism is. Obtaining content to fill a 24-hour time slot puts enormous amounts of pressure on reporters and newsrooms to feed the high demand and expectation from viewers. Everything is faster now. Uh, social media has sped the whole thing up. The addition of social media increases this amount of pressure on reporters substantially. Now, not only do they need to cover events that are happening in real time, they need to also be able to keep up with the quickness of social media and the expectation of nonstop posting. This can sometimes leave little time to verify all aspects of a story. What I think they're doing wrong a lot of the times is trying to make that money line right. You know, trying uh, to keep their numbers up, trying to keep their ratings up. Um, and I think that really can jeopardize journalism. The constant twisting and turning of social media can create problems in trust, something that takes time to build but can quickly disappear. People do not trust the media right now. Um, I think it's. I don't think media is getting worse, so I think it's getting better. It's just that uh, the reputation that people are expressing is changing. This changing reputation causes issues with credibility. We did a survey recently um, about what steps people take to verify their news. It's middle-aged people between the age of 34 and I think 55. They're the people who actually verify their news the most. Young people and older people don't really do it as much. Technology is going to keep growing, constantly increasing the demand for news 24-7. 
It will become more and more important for journalists, consumers, and major news companies to use the digital world wisely. President Donald Trump has not been one to hold back on telling people just what he thinks about certain issues. His thoughts on the media have been no different. DTV's Emmanuel Clinton tells us how Trump's tweets are influencing distrust in the media. Donald Trump is waging war on the media and he's using Twitter as his main weapon and being in the most powerful office in the world, people tend to listen. When he started running for president, he immediately started bashing the media. But it was in front of the CIA where he claimed he was at war. And the reason you're my first stop is that, as you know, I have a running war with the media. They are among the most dishonest human beings on earth. <laughs> Whether it's at a press conference, a speech, an interview, or on Twitter, Trump doesn't always hold back. A president's disliking for the media is nothing new, but with how much time Trump has spent on the subject and the personal attacks has never happened before. Especially through this last presidential election, on, on both sides of the political aisle, we saw kind of a new level of attacks against people in the media. People in the media were reporting stories that challenged uh, the opinions and the beliefs of people from one side of the political aisle or the other. Since he became president, he has tweeted 189 times about fake news, 39 of them attacking CNN, 38 targeting the New York Times, and 36 at NBC, and 192 tweets in favor of Fox News, which Trump does not consider fake news. At the height of this war with the media, the president took the time to host a fake news award show when there were much more important things to do. Quite frankly, I... Uh... I, I in favor of Donald Trump enormously, but I wish he'd shut his mouth and be president. Uh, why he is doing all this, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, email or what, not email, no, Twitter, Twitter and all that other stuff, even I don't understand it, I don't agree with it. This is the main way of how Trump brought the term fake news and the war on media to the light. I think that he attacks the media as much as the media attacks him. So I think that it kind of provides a counterbalance. And I think that, you know, both are allowed to criticize each other. So I think both have that prerogative. Trump has a lot of supporters, and what he says you, stay you are fake news sir. is influencing them to distrust the media. President Donald Trump's constant cries of fake news has turned the phrase from something that was rarely talked about into a buzzword that allows some people to simply dismiss the truth. And I want you all to know that we are fighting the fake news. It's fake, phony, fake. Fake news. Donald Trump has made that term famous. From clickbait stories to political agendas, fake news is spreading like wildfire. But what does the term mean? Fake news is a false story spread on the internet or using other media that looks real and is often used to promote a personal agenda disguised as news reporting. Some organizations are radicals that use a platform to spread their version of news. Stories they play can be true, and some have true facts but do not always reveal the entire story. For all the true stories, there are always others full of opinions and fake facts being used to rile up the general population. Fake news stories are designed to be divisive and look authentic. In one example, an ABC News lookalike website said that Obama was banning the pledge in schools. Totally not true. Another example, written by the Political Insider, twisted the words of the WikiLeaks founder to make it seem that Hillary Clinton was arming Islamic jihadists, including ISIS, when in reality they had been sent to Libya and ended up in the jihadist hands. Former Republican Congresswoman Michelle Bachman was falsely quoted as saying that Jesus created assault rifles on the show Fox and Friends. She was not on the show when the quote started circulating, and it was found that the Facebook page that posted it was a satirical page. Fake news can also be put out by the government itself. An example is when White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer tried to convince reporters that Trump's inauguration crowd was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration in person and around the globe. There was then a post that went viral showing that Trump's crowd was about one-third the size of Obama's. It's hard to figure out what's real and what's not real. Um, especially for folks who aren't trained at all in media literacy because the folks who are putting the bad information out there are so good at it that it looks exactly like a story would look from your local TV station or your local newspaper. 
At first glance, stories like these may look true, and many believe that this is the real news, but it can come from almost anywhere. Your Facebook feed, shows on the internet, and websites. The stories they put out can look very realistic and can easily be mistaken for truth. Another confusing aspect of news publications are advertorials, which are paid advertisements in newspapers and magazines that look like journalistic works and can confuse the reader. Uh, anybody who already has an idea that they're not getting the real story from journalists, whenever the accusation of fake news comes up, it only affirms that idea, right? So if you already didn't believe me, and then I gave you just one little reason not to believe me, then you wouldn't believe me even more, right? The lines of real, fake, and purchased are becoming more blurred, and trying to combat this is not easy. It's important to always check your sources. Some good ways to do so is by reading more into a story past the headline, fact-checking, checking for the author, and checking the date it was written. There are also websites, such as factcheck.org, that can help you sort out the fake headlines. The social media site Facebook is even taking measures to prevent the spread of more fake news through the site by teaming up with Fact Check to shut down fake articles put up, although it may not be as helpful that they are only shut down after it has already been posted. Things on social media spread so fast that it can be hard to take down before the post spreads. A recent MIT study says that fake news spreads faster than truthful news and to more people. The perception of the public is, you know, that some of us are up to no good. I'm not, and I know others who are not. So I think it's tough when you paint with a broad brush. Everybody is like this, you know. Not everybody's like that. Fake news has damaged the credibility of the media for some. It's the job of the journalist to be accurate. But the readers and viewers also have great responsibility to verify what they are taking in and to not spread fake news. We've explored how fake news affects the people's trust and have learned how to better spot fake news when we come across it. Now, DTV's Abby Fulcher tells the story of a writer who used a fake name to write fake news stories and sway opinions in the process. You know, these are the things that people want to hear, and if you can feed into that, then you're going to get them onto your side, and you're going to get them to see, or you're going to get their eyeballs on your, you're going to get them buying your papers or clicking on your stories. Writing fake news was what Joshua Kilborn did for a living, he was a freelance writer who worked alongside a group of fellow writers. They specialized in yellow journalism, which is when a writer will take a fact, exaggerate it, and twist it to a certain bias to incite emotion in a reader. They also wrote fake news. Um, we were writing for a, uh, it, was a it was a fake news website, right, and they write in the lead up to the election, and it was a right-leaning news site. One of the articles that he wrote that got a lot of traffic was about, was about immigrant, or was about illegal immigrants voting. And we used a photoshopped image of people lining up to vote. And the story was about how they were busing illegal immigrants in to vote. And that story hit, this, hit Facebook and that took off. There are companies that hire people like Kilburn to reel in money by clicks and shares. One of these articles works as a distributive process, being posted into many different Facebook groups and spread throughout the internet via shares without most people actually questioning the facts. With the fake news, what we did was we would just go to each other and we would bounce ideas off of each other. And we would say, okay, this sounds like a really good story. I'm going to write this story. All right. Now, with the yellow journalism, what would happen is they would go in and they would post a actual news story inside of the web page, inside of a secret Facebook group that, that they have. They would post the actual story inside of that group. And we would take that story and we would say, okay, so how are we going to put a political slant on this story to match the political slant of our web page? The fake news companies pay per click. Writers could get paid anywhere from less than a dollar to hundreds of dollars per story, gaining around two cents per hit. While Josh does feel a sense of guilt about what he did, when it comes down to it, he had to get paid. I look back on it and wonder what I was thinking, but at the same time, you know, you do what you have to in order to put food on the table and in order to make, a, in order to make money. You do what you have to. And that can be a fairly mercenary attitude to have. But at the end of the day, that was one of the reasons why I quit and opted out of it and basically said, I, I can only go so far with this and I'm not going to go any further. One of the purposes of journalists is to be watchdogs of the government. They should not only inform you about what is going on in your backyard, but your country and the whole world. That is not always an easy task. DTV's Bailey Talaska takes a look into how the news gets it right and sometimes wrong. Sometimes a story can be so complex and have so many layers that it causes the media to miss their mark, be slow to react, or just plain miss the story.
prime example is the media's ongoing coverage of the Flint water crisis. We'll delve into how the media decides what stories to cover and why. It all started with a flip of a switch, a switch from the Detroit water to the Flint River. Soon after came the complaints about discolored or bad smelling water. That is when some members of the media started to look into the water. But it won't be until over a year later that the people of Flint will get the attention they deserve. That's a year filled with poison water, lies, and anger. Because the people of a major city could not drink their water. Not only were most local stations late to cover the story, some later found out that they even got the story wrong by saying that the water was safe to drink. Some of their coverage was based on information given to them by the government or by incomplete testing, making their investigative stories false. Other reporters decided to delve deeper and uncover the stories that revealed the injustices in Flint and the source of lead contamination. One of the first was Kurt Guyette, who was working for the ACLU in Flint. I had been interviewing everybody for the uh, stories I was doing. It seemed like a national uh, progression uh, in, when it became an issue of whether there was really a problem with lead in Flint's water or not to, to work with uh, people that I knew and th that uh, to work together to, to try to get to the truth about what was going on. A few local news outlets covered the water on and off when problems story. started. And with the exception of Rachel Maddow and CNBC, almost no national networks gave airtime to the crisis until the governor declared a state of emergency. Then it's the local and national media started to take interest in Flint. Lead in the water supply in Flint, Michigan. And for most, the interest did not last long. Mainstream media was slow to recognize uh, the issue. Uh, then they came in, in droves and then they went away. But the problem did not go away. The ever-changing news cycle and the failure to follow up or stick to stories is a reoccurring criticism of the media. If the media can't get the story right, how are the American people supposed to fully trust in them? Maybe if the media had continued their investigations and hadn't been so quick to take the government's word, Flint would have gotten help sooner. To be honest about it, in the, in the beginning, you know, um, you know, don't don't let us go this long without keeping, you know, I mean, keeping us in the blind on, you know, on this water. Another aspect where the media gets a lot of questions is how and why they pick which stories to run. That board you see right over there are all the stories that people have had ideas from. We don't go on all of them, but they try to pick the best ones and they try to have a balance of, you know, all right, this is really hard. This could be kind of depressing, but all right, Santa's coming to this one. <laughs> and this is a, you know, a soft, fuzzy story. So that there's a good balance that the show isn't all one way or the other. News stations choosing to cover the topics that will get them the most likes and clicks, like the Kardashians, make some people automatically dismiss and have a disconnect with their news. At appreciation of this day, let's look back at some of our favorite squirrels from over the years. But like any job, there is going to be people who give the rest a bad reputation. I think our reputation has gone down a little bit in recent years. Um, some of it's deserved, I gotta be honest with you. But I think some of it's unfair. You know, it, 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 reporters are right down there with used car salesmen and uh, lawyers <laughs> at this point, right, as far as reputation goes. Um, and I think some of that's unfair. I'm here to stand up for hardworking reporters, photographers, producers, people that work in newsrooms to say, look, it's not all like that. There's people that work hard and that tell accurate stories and who are fair and balanced. Um, I think we're getting a bad reputation that, and, and some of it, like I say, is undeserved. Criticism of news media has caused many people to lose faith in what they are taking in. But trust may not be out of reach. DTV's Abby Fulcher has a story on what the future of news holds and how the people need to continue to evolve in both their storytelling and their news consumption. With these facts presented, you may be left wondering, what does the future hold and how can we gain that trust again? Trust in the media is down. But if we're at a critical impasse, if you're asking if the trust is lost forever, I don't think so. In order to achieve redemption and put trust back in journalism, there are three critical pieces in need of change to complete this whole puzzle. The role of journalists, the way media is consumed, and how to better the technological platform of media. The future of truth and journalism are dependent on this. Everything begins with the journalist. The kind of content they produce will always have a certain effect on an audience. Uh, but ultimately, I think, young journalists and established journalists really just have to get back to the basics of what journalism is about. It's about seeking out the truth and reporting it, regardless of 
who gets upset because you're not reporting the story the way that they think the story should be reported. If a journalist is reporting the facts and keeping their opinion and their own personal biases out of their work, then that's what matters. When up against a deadline, journalists are not always given the time needed to dig deeper into bigger stories, which can lead to important facts being left out. Another important piece in need of change is how media is consumed. Where can someone become educated on what is true and what is false in the media? Does it begin in schools, at home, or is it the role of journalists themselves? Start by learning to view all of your sources before forming an opinion. The way to fix fake news, obviously, is don't make dumb errors. Social media has opened the door for the spread of fake news. The way a social media platform is used to present facts or opinions can be beneficial, but can also be the biggest downfall. Some feel the root of a digital landscape for media can be troubling, but as the years progress and technology advances, people must learn to educate themselves on the platform switch. It can be used as a source of truth rather than the enemy of propaganda. I think that people were afraid of what impact the internet would have. And like I said, it has had some negative impacts, but it's given a lot of different people voices in the conversation. And so I think, it, I think it's a bright future because I think you've got a lot of different perspectives. Social media has also given a voice to journalists who are otherwise muted by larger media corporations who may have an agenda. Well, the news has shown alarming trends, causing trust to be low and reporters' credibility attacked every day, it is not all bad. There are still many good journalists working diligently to be the change that brings back trust to the people. While it may seem difficult now, it is possible. It is up to both journalists and the public to break the barrier between them and kickstart this change. As educated news consumers, you can be the difference and restore the ability to freely say, in news we trust.